Let us confess together. Merciful Father, we confess that we are sinners. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Your scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, but God who is just will, will bless us and will forgive us our sins. I'm here to tell you the good news today, folks. We are a forgiven people. I declare that our sins are forgiven because of the power and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if that's not good news, I don't know what is. Amen. Say happy Easter. Say good morning. Say he is risen to your neighbor. Welcome them in love. <laughs> amen, amen. Well, welcome to St. Paul's. If this is your first time joining us today, we are so delighted to have you. God's grace and peace to you on this Easter Sunday morning. Just open up with a word of prayer. Father Jesus, you've given us your son, and he is alive. He is risen, and he is a living God, and we thank you, and we praise you for that today, Lord. Just fill us up with your joy and your peace, and may we come together as a family to praise you today. Amen.
moments where we really look forward to the coming of our King again. And in the midst of all of this, we have each other and we have our precious Savior who's come to this world, who's lived as we've lived and has died for our sins, and that is the good news. And it is just so beautiful to, to come and sing in freedom and to celebrate that joy and to spread it among our neighbors. Jesus, there are times where, where we forget, where we, we don't even know, and you still come to us, and you still whisper your love into our ears, and you still pick us up and carry us along. 
And Lord God, we praise you for that. We praise you that, that you have an intimacy with our lives and that you desire to grow closer and closer to us. In your name, amen. You may stand up for this, this here number if you're so inclined. <laughs> this is the Easter song, and we're just, again, this is about praising our Lord, and we have so much joy to give to our Savior. And I hope you're all planning to attend 6 o'clock next Sunday night. And if you have been to Global Worship, you know. If you haven't, you want to know. Come on in and see what it looks like. The pictures from past years are decorating the lobby out there. 
um, in, in that room over, over there. So take a look at the pictures. You'll have an idea of what to expect. It's a wonderful time of praising God with people from, from many different cultures who live right in, and work right with us in the Twin Cities here. Uh, welcome to Global Worship next week. Welcome to St. Paul's as we gather on this resurrection morning. I'd like to pastor, thank Pastor Tim for his good, uh, if you weren't here on Friday night, his presentation of Pilate was absolutely 
amazing. He did Pia Pontius. And uh, also like to thank Richard for uh, all the extra lighting, both the, uh, Friday night and this morning. Uh, it's been quite striking. So now, as we start, first of all, I'd like to welcome our visitors. We've got a bunch of visitors with us this morning and hope that as we gather that you recognize that Jesus is present because he promised to be where two or three are gathered in his name. And I hope that he touches your life this morning, that something in the worship, as you hear God's word as being sung or being read or in the sermon, that, that, you'll, that he'll meet you and, and touch you in a way this morning that, uh, that somehow brings something new and alive and fresh into your life. That's what we're about. I'm Pastor Roland Wells. I suppose I should introduce myself as well. Um, and we're glad that you're here. Please stop past our visitor's booth out in the uh, Narthex lobby area out there, and uh, uh, we've got a little gift for you, and uh, we'd like to be able to remember that you were here with us. All right, now we've got a bunch of announcements. Next Sunday, we just heard the commercial, but wait, there's more. Um, we'll give you two, with extra shipping and handling, two global worship. No, that's not right. Next week is Global Worship, and Global Worship, because our sister church, the uh, Ebenezer Oromo, meets here uh, right after we do, um, we also have a challenge in that we have a tremendous amount of stuff that has to be set up, a whole huge sound system that has to be put up for that, and many, many microphones and lights and marching bands and elephants and trapezes and stuff. And all this stuff has to be set up. So in order to make more room and more time, uh, we will be worshiping with the Ebenezer congregation. However, it will be at 10 a.m. Everybody say 10 a.m. Next Sunday, 10 a.m. Everybody got that? Next Sunday, 10 a.m. You can sleep in. Pick up that hour of sleep you lost a few weeks ago. This is a good deal. And then global worship starts at 6 p.m., and we expect to be, again, packed out as we have been these last several years. An amazing time. It's not a concert. Yes, all kinds of people are singing and bringing music and stuff. It is a worship time. It is a worship time, and that's what's central. Have you got something you want to talk about? You're not on here, but anybody carrying an Easter egg probably should have time to make an announcement. Come on up. Well, right after the service, we're inviting all the children and their grandparents and parents if they want to come. And, you know, the egg is in a symbol that we always have at Easter because when it's empty, it reminds us of the tomb. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the egg with our children and finding we're having an egg hunt downstairs. The whole thing will probably last 15 minutes, but I think it'll be fun for the kids, and so we welcome you to come downstairs rather than going upstairs this Sunday. We go downstairs to the basement. See you after the service. Yes, one more thing. We can thank the German Lutherans for bringing in the egg to our whole tradition. Yeah. So the, the egg is empty, the, the, and that's no yolk. We didn't have that rehearsed. Now, a few other quick things. On uh, Tuesday night, because this was Holy Week and it was when we normally do our committee meetings, we're going to kind of everything together this Tuesday night. So prayers at 6.30. Committees will meet for one hour really quickly and get everything done at, at 7. And then council will meet from 8 o'clock until 3 a.m. or whenever we get our business done. No, it hasn't been running very late lately. So I've been getting a lot done. Okay, so that's this Tuesday night, all the committees at 7 a.m. PM. Now, a few other quick things. On a Tuesday, April 25th at 11 o'clock, they are, um, next fall, the LCMC gathering is going to be here in Minneapolis, and it's going to be at a hotel downtown. We have the details on that, but they need volunteers, and if you can come and be trained in for that, April, Tuesday, April 25th, one hour meeting at 11 a.m., and come and see me, and I'll tell you about where it's at. It's at the, the downtown Hilton, so that's coming up. Messenger Boot Camp is continuing to meet here on Saturdays. There's still time to join them. And then for those of you who are deacon shepherds, and you know who you are, 
that have been chosen for that. Don't forget that we have a special training uh, on Tuesday night, April 25th, from 7 to 8.30. Pastor Tom Parrish is going to be sharing that. And uh, so that's the 25th, Tuesday the 25th. Okay, thank you to all of you who provided Easter lilies for today. They're beautiful. And uh, we always look forward to that. But they, a bunch of our, of our members spent a bunch of time yesterday decorating all this all over the place. And thank you very much for Barb and Lois and, and, and your minions. Uh, Miranda was in on that. Brenda was in on that. And I'm not sure anybody else in on that yesterday. And... Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, okay, Dennis Lockie. Okay, good. Uh, let's pray for that siren. Father, we ask you to watch over those folks and the, both the, the caregivers and those that are going to go care in, for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to let you read the rest of the bulletin all by yourself. And on the back, we've got uh, an update on the Petrosvodsk uh, Christian Center and some exciting things that are happening there as it's been an extension of work that's happened through us. And we also, just to embarrass her, welcome Becky Bedertha home for the weekend. Happy Easter. All right, let's hear our lessons. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Our first reading will be from, um, found on page 649 of your Pew Bible. Um, we are going to read Psalm 18, parts of it. We'll read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll go to verses 14 through 24. Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. And then down to um, verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become my cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My husband's favorite verse. Our next reading, it will be found on page 1222 of your pew Bible. We're going to read from um, the, the first chapter, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This was written by Paul to the church that he founded in Corinth, in Corinth and he wrote this um, in response to his um, understanding of what was happening in, in Corinth. Some, of, some people in Corinth were saying that there was no resurrection of the body. Paul refutes this false teaching by saying, if there's no resurrection from the body, then there's not even, that, not, that Christ didn't even um, wasn't even raised. So we're going to start with, let's start with um, 1 Corinthians 15, let's start with verse 17. Paul writes, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who had fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people must be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who, who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, 
Christ, the first fruits, the best, the perfect lamb, the extra virgin olive oil, the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God and the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Here ends the readings. Our gospel is from John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Please rise. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb, and both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him. He went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around. And saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Second time that's been asked. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Well, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, my teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. He is risen. You may be seated. I talked last week about how this Christ figure has been implanted in every culture and in stories from the beginning of time over and over again, but only one person has fulfilled it. Um, It's funny how some of these themes come out. Throughout all of civilization, people also love a story where at the end, the good man with troubles is delivered or when the tables are turned on the bad guy, the rich and powerful bad guy. I mean, if if somebody does something terrible in a half-hour TV show at the beginning, you know what's going to happen at the end. They're either going to go to jail or die, right? I mean, that's, that there's justice. It's just imprinted on us, and we love that. Well, there's this cheapskate guy, and he goes to a second-hand store. He's so cheap because he needs to buy a wedding present. And he goes there, and he finds an expensive antique vase, but it's cracked. Now, because of the crack, he pays a fraction 
of what the vase would have been worth if it wasn't cracked. So the cheapskate pays for it, and then he asks the clerk, oh, I'd like you to break the vase and then put it in a box and ship it to the address I give you. Well, the clerk figured out right away the cheap man bought a present that looked like it was really nice, but now the couple would think it was broken in shipment. Probably want the antique store to pay for it. Hmm? Well, weeks later, the, the cheap man gets, gets a thank you note from the couple, thanking him for the lovely vase and, and remarking how nice it was that both pieces were so carefully wrapped individually. The clerk had the last word. <laughs> now, we love it when there's a twist at the end like that, don't we? It doesn't just kind of... Yeah. In every culture, in every time, stories with a twist in the plot where evil is defeated and good triumphs with a surprise are the basis of most literature, not to mention good jokes. How amazing it is that God has prepared all people everywhere for the joyous surprise of the Easter story. This, a story that, of the devil thinking he has finally won it all. He knew who Jesus was. He tempted Jesus, maneuvered him into a political trap. The devil gets him killed. And finally it appears that Satan's claim to the human realm on earth is true and settled once and for all. Oh, the agony of the universe for those three days and three nights. But when it seemed impossible, God raised him, God raised Jesus from the dead. Death had no claim over him, alleluia. He was innocent, he was sinless, and although he willingly took sin on himself, his father declared him, not guilty. The greatest defeat of all of history has become the greatest victory of all. Alleluia. And then on that early, early morning, when it's too dark to see clearly, Jesus comes to Mary Magdalene and to us this morning. And he looks her and he looks us in the eye and he says, why are you weeping? Life's full of things that make us weep. Buddha said that the nature of life is suffering. I don't know if that's true, but there sure seems to be enough to go around. There's sadness and pain and loss. Some have experienced the death of somebody in their family this year. Some have experienced health crises or betrayal lost jobs, illnesses that won't break up, relationships that aren't going well. All of us are weeping someplace. And Jesus comes this morning in the midst of that life full of brokenness and death and sadness and disappointment and challenges that seem too great. And he looks us in the eye and he says, why are you weeping? Now, Paul, we heard his writings in that passage from 1 Corinthians. Paul had talked with many people who had seen Jesus after the resurrection. There were hundreds, maybe thousands. Before Paul's conversion, he had put many of those witnesses to death. Now, all they would have had to do to save their lives was say, oh, yeah, this, this resurrection story, yeah, we made that up, just joking. All they had to say was it was untrue. Say they made it up, but they were willing to die instead. They died with Paul watching. Then the risen Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus, and his life would never be the same again because now he believed. You know, Paul could have saved himself being laughed at by the philosophers in Athens. 
He could have saved himself being stoned almost to death. Being lashed could have saved the bite of the beheading axe of Rome. All he would have had to do was say, oh, this resurrection thing is a fire, so we just made that all up. But he couldn't do it because he knew, he knew that it was true. Put everything on that, hinged it all on that. He said, if, if we believe in Jesus for this life only, if there is no resurrection, then we above all people are most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He knew it was true. It's the greatest one central truth in the entire world. It's the most, sense, most important single truth in the language of all people of all times. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and is Lord of all. Alleluia. So why are you weeping? This story's for you. This life is for you. It's a gift. Today as we gather with believers of all times and all places today, a billion people on the earth name the name of Jesus. They rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus. Today, in a world where Christians are killed as they worship, in a world where, even so, where evil often, so often seems to triumph, Jesus comes to us with nail-scarred hands and asks, why are you weeping? He has given us life. Today, I invite you all to come and join that celebration. Not as an onlooker of the resurrection, but as one who follows Jesus. How can you follow Jesus? By confessing your sin and asking him to come into your heart to rule you. How much do you have to believe? Jesus says, like a grain of mustard seed, whatever you've got, that's where God starts. He calls you to trust in him. He has been raised from the dead. He's the only one in history. He has taken your sin on himself, and he loves you, and he calls you to know him personally, calls you to know him into the, a relationship that lasts not only for a lifetime, but for eternity. Hear the call today. Don't put it off. Join the celebration. As we go to our time of prayer, right there in the pew this morning, you can join this celebration right from the depth of your heart. Ask Jesus to show you that he's real. Ask him to fill you with himself, to take your life. We offer ourselves. We trust in Jesus. He is risen. That's all that matters. That's why Jesus says, why are you weeping? He's come to fill us with joy. Let us rejoice. Amen.